Cool. So uh, my name is Jim Vada. I'm going to give you a 30-minute talk on 802.11ax channel access. And <clears throat> what I want to talk about is really the whole picture of channel access today. Not so much looking at new features in isolation, but putting them in context uh, with what goes on with EDCA uh, that we've inherited from previous generations of Wi-Fi. Um, and, and other things. And I only want to talk about the parts of the standard that have actually been implemented and the methods that are actually being implemented by client and AP vendors. Not everything under the sun that's theoretical. Um, and I think this is valuable to do this uh, occasionally to kind of take a deep dive into channel access because it really informs the design principles that we use. And so it's useful to go in and say, does this still make sense? Do the new band-aids for CCI kind of change the equation for how we design Wi-Fi networks? Uh, so that's what I want to look at today. So this should look familiar uh, to all of us. Uh, this is how a lot of us learned uh, channel access works in Wi-Fi. We've got a CCA period with uh, a, a AIFS, a contention uh, window with a random back off, RTS-CTS for nav protection, then we can transmit. And the CCA has a signal detect threshold, an energy detect threshold, uh, and we just kind of think about one 20 megahertz channel. Uh, but there's a lot more going on now to discuss. Uh, Secondary channels for wide channels, especially 6 gigahertz, where 80 megahertz is going to be the, the dominant channel width. Uh, there's a unique CCA there that we need to account for. Uh, in some cases, APs are going to support spatial reuse operation. So different signal detect thresholds for uh, OBSS frames. We have an, a, a new set of EDCA parameters, the multi-user EDCA parameters. And at some, during some periods, clients are using these. And in other periods, they're using the WMM parameters. Uh, and w whenever we're doing uh, wide channels, we always have to back off for at least a PIFS uh, before we transmit. Um, even if we, we have lost contention, over and over, and our you know, random back off timer gets smaller and smaller. Has to be a PIFS every time. Uh, and now we've got two NAVs in 802.11ax. So an intra BSS NAV uh, for all the traffic within the BSS, and a basic NAV for all the OBSS traffic. Um, and uh, BSS color that's in the preamble of 802.11ax formatted frames. Uh, but there's another field in that preamble that's overlooked a little bit that's really cool. There, there's a TX op duration field. Uh, so that allows the nav to get distributed really widely um, because the preamble is modulated at a very low data rate. Um, and then kind of the last wrinkle with channel access is um, with uplink OFDMA, uh, the AP might require the clients to do carrier sense within their resource unit before they can transmit. Uh, so we'll talk through all that. I thought it'd be valuable just to look at the, some examples of how all this stuff works together. Uh, and these slides are going to go on Twitter uh, pretty soon, uh, at 7Signal, so you can download them. Uh, but let's take the example of a single user 80 megahertz transmission uh, in the 6 gigahertz band. So channel 5 is going to be our primary channel. It's the PSC. And we start with a much more elaborate CCA. Um, and so this is um, uh, APs and clients will do this for single user transmission. And we're starting with uh, you know, our, our normal CCA in the primary channel, signal detect, energy detect thresholds uh, that we're used to. Then we might also apply an 
OBSS packet detect threshold from spatial reuse. Uh, and that channel has to be idle before we go on and check the rest of the channels. It always has to be idle for us to transmit um, uh, with a wide channel. Um, next, we'll check the secondary channels. And that happens during that PIFS of 25 microseconds. Uh, and it's got to be 25 microseconds because that's how long guard in interval autocorrelation works. And if I had an advanced degree in mathematics, I could explain that to you. But basically the idea is we're not using our normal signal detect in the secondary channels. We're using this GI autocorrelation kind of as a stand-in for that. And it's not as sensitive. You can see the uh, the sensitivity for signal detect there at neg 72 dBm. Our energy detect thresholds are not as sensitive either. And we might also apply that OBSS packet detect threshold there as well. Uh, so if all that clears and both of our NAVs are at zero, then we can transmit and we start with um, RTS-ETS duplicated on all four uh, sub-channels. Uh, that gives us our, our nav protection. We send our giant 80 megahertz wide frame, uh, the preamble of which has a BSS color that spatial reuse and dual nav work on. Uh, and, and the preamble has that TX operation. So we're adding protection, uh, reinforcing that nav protection. And then in response, we'd get duplicated block acts uh, across the four uh, uh, sub-channels as well. Um, so that's single user mode. Let's talk about OFDMA, um, because we tend to see this a lot more often than multi-user MIMO. Um, and the AP has to win the channel, right? We all know that. The AP has to win the channel for, uh, for this to take place but it's using the same CCA we just talked through. Now, it might have an advantage if uh, multi-user EDCA parameters are in play, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but it's doing the same kind of classic CCA, check, checking each sub-channel, uh, the full 20 megahertz of which it checks. Uh, then we do RTS-CTS. Uh, then downlink OFDMA happens, and there's a lot of good resources that'll explain the details of that. Uh, and then that's followed by a brief period of uplink OFDMA with the same RU allocation where clients send a block hack uh, uh, back to the AP. So that's an example of what that looks like. Uh, but one of the things this illustrates is because of that sort of legacy CCA, if you will, we're not using OFDMA to uh, you know, just transmit on the subcarriers within the channel that are free from interference. We either use the whole channel or we don't because the CCA is the CCA. It's looking at the whole channel and the whole channel's idle or it's busy. Uh, so let's look at uplink OFDMA. So this is where things are probably the most complex with 802.11ax. So again, the AP has to win the channel, even though we're gonna get clients transmitting simultaneously, has to happen while the AP owns uh, a TX op. And uh, same channel access we saw before, same CCA, uh, RTS, ETS again, uh, and then something new happens. The AP sends a trigger frame. The most common format is this basic trigger but there's a bunch of other formats, and I've seen examples of, of a lot of them. So beam forming, request polling, you see that a lot too. Uh, then uplink OFDMA happens, uh, and all the clients transmit into their RUs, but before they do that, they might be required all the way down at this step to do carrier sense themselves before they transmit. So even more, channel access checking going on here. Uh, but this is like a really modified uh, carrier sense. They're really just ch checking two things. This is where dual nav comes into play. The intra-BSS nav 
uh, is a, a non-zero value because the APs got a, a TX op. Uh, they only check the basic nav here uh, to see if there's any OBSS uh, traffic going on, and they only do energy detect. They don't do signal detect because it's you know, hard to do within a, a smaller RU. Um, so if uh, carrier sense is required by the AP, it'll say so in that trigger frame that precedes this, and usually that's kind of uh, uh, determined based on the length of the TX op. The longer it is, the more likely carrier sense is going to be required of the, the clients. Uh, and then the last step is a duplicated multi-station block act sent in the downlink. Uh, I'm showing this example with uh, OFDM modulated frames. You see that a lot uh, for the, the block acts and the triggers. They don't have to be, uh, but that seems to be the most uh, common way this, is, this has been implemented. And it makes sense, right? That gives uh, a legacy, uh, you know, the older FIs, the ability to read the, the duration fields here. Uh, so I just talked through a lot. I didn't talk about everything in native to 11AX. The two things I left out were preamble puncturing, because I haven't seen anyone implement that yet and uplink OFDMA, OFDMA random access. Really cool feature. Again, haven't seen anybody implement it yet. Uh, so let's uh, dive into some of these. BSS coloring is, is just coloring, right? It's, it's just the tags that get added in the preamble and in the uh, information elements in the beacons and probe responses, but it doesn't really do anything on its own. So usually, you know, in, when marketing people are talking about it, they really mean BSS coloring with spatial reuse operation. That's what actually makes use of this. Uh, so let's talk about SRO. Uh, so this is a really new and interesting capability. It's uh, optional, but some APs are supporting this now. Um, and it gives us that OBSS packet detect threshold so we apply a different signal detect threshold to OBSS frames, frames coming from CCI. Um, and we use our normal thresholds for intra-BSS frames. Uh, so there's some, some good and bad with this. Uh, the, the good is, uh, and bad are both illustrated in, actually here. Uh, first, you know, we've got an AP in this example transmitting on the downlink to a client. Uh, but there's an OBSS station that starts transmitting during the AP CCA. So the AP hears that frame. The BSS color doesn't match, so it knows it's OBSS. Uh, and it sees that you know, the signal strength is low enough at the AP's receiver that uh, it's below the OBSS packet detect threshold, so it transmits. So we get better spectral efficiency this way. We can reuse the channel more often. But uh, it's, it comes with a cost. So there's, sometimes there's winners and losers with this. The AP has the opportunity to rate shift. It can recognize that the SNR is temporarily different uh, during this period and lower its MCS rate accordingly and change its transmit power in this example. But uh, unfortunately, that OBSS station, it doesn't have any prior knowledge this is going to occur. So the reception of its frame could be impacted. Uh, and really, we, we don't know anything at all about the receiver of that OBSS frame. It could be closer to the AP or further away. So the impact on its SNR, uh, we don't know. Uh, it could be significant enough that uh, the OBSS station has to retry the frame and uh, eventually rate shift um, on its own. Um, and you can think about this, you know, with if both BSSs support SRO, then they kind of change roles back and forth as one's transmitting uh, over top of the other, and they kind of can step on each other. 
so it's a, it's a useful feature, but I think you have to use it with care. And I think, you know, what, what, uh, what kind of got reinforced with me the more I learned about it was it doesn't replace the need for a great uh, channel reuse plan. You know, you, the way to minimize the potential uh, harm from this is by keeping APs on the same channel as far away as possible, like we do now. Uh, so, you know, CCI is still a priority to remove from our designs as much as possible. Um, and, uh, right, so I already talked about that. Uh, dual nav, uh, just talk about this quickly. There's really three problems this solves. Talked about it um, being required for uplink OFDMA carrier sense. Um, but the other thing that can happen is, uh, particularly if we have primary, secondary OBSS, uh, we could have a situation like this where an RTS just shows up on the channel from an OBSS station because it's secondary channel, CCA is not as sensitive. So it sends an RTS. And it could cause a collision and it could uh, change the nav for any stations on that channel incorrectly. So with dual nav, with the basic nav, it might be set by the RTS frame but the intra-BSS uh, nav is not. Um, so we have protection for our nav protection uh, in this case. Um, this is also true for data frames now, right? Because 802.11ax data frames in the preamble have that TX op field. Uh, and that means every frame is going to distribute the nav broadly. Um, whereas uh, with previous FIs, you know, the duration field was only in the layer two header, and with higher data rates, you didn't have uh, as much um, range with those. Um, so this helps, that's the third problem it helps with. Uh, and it's worth thinking about how all these things work together. If spatial reuse operation is occurring, then uh, OBSS frames that are below its packet detect threshold won't do anything to the nav. They'll just be discarded before, before that happens. Okay, so I want to talk about um, some differences with 80 megahertz channel access. Um, this is, uh, a, a lot of this applies to 802.11ac as well, um, with the exception of uh, spatial reuse operation. Um, the primary channel we check first, and it has to be idle before we can go on. And we have our most sensitive CCA there. Then the secondary channels are checked during that PIFS. Uh, and the CCAs are not as sensitive. So this is one of the reasons um, that in David Coleman's talk, we saw you know, the really negative impact of uh, primary, secondary OBSS. Uh, because this, there's that CCA mismatch. Um, the other thing that can happen here, depending on the outcome of the CCA and the subchannels, is uh, we might use dynamic bandwidth operation, which would allow us to use whatever channel width uh, from the primary channel is available. So we could go 20, 40, or 80 in this case, depending on uh, uh, what channels were idle or busy. Or we could use static bandwidth operation, which would require all four channels to be idle before we transmit anything. Uh, and so uh, we'll check that during CCA, and also feedback from RTS-CTS uh, informs dynamic bandwidth operation of what to do. And some APs will do static, and some will do dynamic. Uh, so, you know, that's where the need for preamble puncturing and the next gener generation of Wi-Fi comes in. Because if you think about using 320 megahertz channels, uh, that's already scary enough. But now you've got 16 sub-channels you're doing CCA in before you can transmit. It's a huge opportunity to get blocked from, from transmitting. Um, 
And I also want to mention here, uh, uh, in 6 gigahertz, which is purely 802.11ax, we don't have to do RTS-CTS because the preamble is going to distribute the nav and everybody there can hear it uh, just as robustly as an RTS uh, frame would. Uh, but in the examples I've seen from 6 gigahertz APs, they're still doing the RTS-CTS. Uh, okay, so multi-user EDCA, this is really interesting. Um, I think this can really, uh, is, is an important factor in seeing more OFDMA and scheduling occur. So what happens here uh, during periods of uplink OFDMA is that once a client's been scheduled for a particular access category, it's no longer going to use the WMM parameters to win channel access. It's now going to use these multi-user ed parameters. Okay, and so uh, they're normally configured so the arbitration interframe spacing is longer, the uh, uh, minimum contention window is longer, uh, and then, so that disadvantages them from winning channel access and gives uh, an advantage to uh, the AP. So it can continue winning the channel and, and scheduling OFDMA. Uh, and then a couple of things about that. There's a, there's a timer here from multi-user EDCA per access category. So once that expires, the client goes back to using the WMM parameters. Uh, and if it, it restarts every time it's scheduled again. Um, so here's an example. You can see the, the differences in the uh, uh, multi-user EDCA versus the WMM parameters for the best effort queue. Uh, but there's another trick that multi-user EDCA allows, and that's that if you set the uh, AIFSN to zero, then that 11AX station that was scheduled for uplink OFDMA in that access category uh, is barred. It can't do contention for, uh, to win channel access for itself. Um, so if, if we think about a pure 11AX environment like 6 gigahertz, this is really cool if we want more scheduling to occur. If we, think we have a super high density network with a lot of small packets and we think OFDMA is going to help us out, uh, I think we would like to be able to get more ag aggressive with this stuff uh, and tune it to make that happen more or less uh, if we want to. Now, I don't know of any vendors that have exposed the multi-user EDCA parameters to be changed. You kind of get what you get out of the box and uh, there's some diversity and what different vendors are doing with this. Uh, but it would be wonderful to have uh, control over that. So in 6 gigahertz, this is pretty neat. But in 2.4 and 5, it's kind of a mixed bag because you still have the legacy FIs, a lot of clients that are 11AX, 11N, and previous, they don't play by these rules. They just do EDCA the way it always worked. So you're, you would disadvantage the 11AX clients, uh, but not the, the other FIs as well. So kind of a mixed bag there. Uh, and the one thing that, uh, one other thing here is that clients, 11AX clients can opt out of this with an operating mode indication frame, but the AP has to allow them to send the AP that frame. So not sure how that'll play out. Uh, so, you know, that leaves us with a, a much more complex picture of channel access uh, with all the, the new features that have been implemented in 802.11ax uh, and using wider channels, uh, which will be much more common. And uh, that means there's, you know, we spend more time checking the channels and, and that gives us more opportunity for things to go wrong. There's more channels to check. And, uh, you know, we have some new tools to help us with CCI. 
Uh, but it doesn't really change the uh, Wi-Fi de design fundamentals, uh, in my opinion. We're still always better off with non-overlapping channels as much as possible. Uh, I, you know, CCI is still a huge design priority for reducing as much as possible. Uh, but with you know the increase in complexity, I think that gulf between well-designed uh, networks and kind of undesigned or poorly designed networks is just going to grow. Because uh, you can think of, you know, we kind of talk through examples where all this stuff works, all the checks pass, and we get to transmit. Uh, but when things aren't designed well, when there is primary, secondary, OBSS, when, uh, when uh, channels are blocked, um, it's almost even worse now for poorly designed networks than it, it was with previous FIs. Uh, so thank you.